Hello and welcome back to Mad MFI True Crime. I still can't get used to speaking in my normal voice. <laughs> Maybe because I record these after I've done my ASMR videos, uh, so I've been whispering and then I do these. Anyway, um, this channel is dedicated to all things true crime, but unlike my other channel, instead of whispering those crimes, I do them at a normal volume. So if you like true crime but don't like whispers, this is the channel for you. Um, today I am telling you all about Donald Nielsen, who was better known as the Black Panther. Um, I'm sorry if my voice is sounding a little crackly. Um, I don't know what's wrong, I've got a bit of a sore throat at the minute, don't worry, I'm fine, I've not been out of the house, it's probably not Covid. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna jump straight into things today, I think. Uh, Donald Nielsen was born in August 1936. His surname that he was born with was actually Nappy, and because of this it made him the target for bullies. Um, because children are absolutely awful. And I know because I used to have an awful surname. <laughs> um, and he swore that he would change his name as soon as he could. Uh, such was his resentment towards this bullying. An old school friend of Don Donald's described him as a fearless and daring person, the quiet leader of a small bunch of friends. And he loved to always prove that he was the best through daring antics such as jumping off roofs which to me sounds like you know a proper boys thing back in that century um when donald was 11 his mother sadly died the loss of his mother hurt him greatly as he had always felt that his mother was the one person he could rely on as his father didn't have much time for him after his mother's death Donald's father had a string of relationships and would often bring these women back to the house and quite often Donald would be kicked out of the house because of arguments he'd had with his father's new partners. After school, Donald had to complete what was known as national service as it was a crime at the time for all boys, I think it was age 18 to 21. Uh, he relished army life and gained a keen interest in guns and survivalism, which he maintained for the rest of his life. He probably would have made a career out of the military had it not been for his fiancée, later wife, Irene Tate, who persuaded him that he should return to Bradford and settle down. And who wants to live in Bradford? Um, apparently they did. In the 1960s, the couple had a daughter that they named Catherine, and it was after her birth that Donald decided to change his name by deed poll to Nielsen to protect Catherine from the same bullying that he had been subjected to. There's some debate as to where he got the name Nielsen from. Uh, some friends say that it was the name of the guy that had sold him his taxi that he started his taxi business with but a lodger who had lived with the couple in the early 60s said that the name came from an ice cream van where Donald and Irene would often go and buy their daughter ice cream from. After he had settled in Bradford, Nielsen began working as a carpenter but struggled to make ends meet. He then tried setting up a taxi business and his own security company, but success always eluded him. These failures made him become an overbearing and domineering husband and he became obsessed with discipline and routine, the same discipline and routine that he'd had in his life when he was in the army. He continued his passion for the military by forcing his wife and child to participate in games of soldiers, as he called it. He had bought an old army jeep and he'd 
got full sets of military clothing and he'd drive the family for days out in the Yorkshire Dales and when they were in the Yorkshire Dales he'd make them dress up in this military clothing and then he'd make them pose around the jeep and he'd or like in ditches and stuff and he'd take pictures of them and then he'd print these pictures and these pictures would be his family photo album pictures um I suppose takes all sorts. Nielsen had had no criminal career, or criminal history rather, in his youth, but in 1965 he decided to turn to burglary following the failures of his businesses. He developed a technique using a brace and bit to drill a hole in the window frame and then a screwdriver or coat hanger to open up the catch. West Yorkshire police referred to him as the brace and bit robber. But although he was extremely skilled at getting in and out of properties, he never hit the jackpot, as it were, and his proceeds from this were all relatively small. In 1967, Nielsen branched out into rubbing sub-post offices. The logic behind this move was that although the sub-post offices would hold less cash than the big post office locations, they usually had less security, and there were also 23,000 of them in the UK, so there was a massive choice of targets. His first target was a sub post office in Nottingham and he raided 18 more in both Lancashire and Yorkshire. On February the 16th 1972 Nielsen broke into a sub post office in Hayward, Lancashire. The owner Leslie Richardson had woken had woken up and had gone out of his bedroom when he was confronted by this hooded figure. A struggle ensued and Leslie said the man spoke with a West Indian accent. Uh, during the struggle, the shotgun that Nielsen was carrying went off and no one was injured, it just shot a hole in the ceiling. Richardson managed to remove the hood that Nielsen was wearing and get a... It said a good look at him, but you'll see what I mean later. Um, Nielsen then made an escape up out of the back door. Richardson helped police create a photo fit of the intruder. Six more would be created throughout the course of the investigation, but none of these photo fits looked the same, and none of them actually looked anything like Dennis uh, Donald Nielsen. Dennis Nielsen, different serial killer. Um, so yeah, he kind of got that good of a look at him if the f if the photo fit that he created from his description looked nothing like the guy. In 1974, Nielsen targeted a sub post office in Harrogate. After tying up the sub postmaster's son, he confronted, he confronted the postmaster, Donald Skepper, who was still in bed with his wife. Skepper attempted to apprehend Nielsen and was shot as he leapt towards him. Nielsen left empty handed and Skipper and Skepper rather unfortunately died from his wounds. Police at this point had made a connection between this robbery and the one two years earlier in Haywood, even though the photo fits didn't look alike. By September, more than 30,000 people had been interviewed in the search for a man that the press had dubbed the Black Panther. Nielsen quite enjoyed this nickname. In fact, he bought a statue of a Black Pan Panther that he kept in his house um, as a kind of trophy, I guess. Uh, the next time Nielsen struck, he chose a different and more cunning method of entry after his previous tussles with the sub postmasters. This time he knocked on the back door of the sub post office in Langley, West Midlands. When Sydney Greylands answered, Nielsen was waiting with a torch which had a bottle of ammonia attached. Nielsen tried to squirt Sydney Greylands in the face, but unfortunately only squirted himself in the face. Well, I say unfortunately, the guy killed people. Um, this meant that he was, he was forced to remove the hood that he was wearing. Um, as he did this, uh, Sydney Greyland's wife entered the room. 
Uh, this prompted Nielsen to attack her and shoot Mr. Greylands. He left with £800 in postal orders. Mr. Grayland died, but his wife, who sustained a skull fracture, survived and was able to give a description. Again, the description and the photo fit produced looked nothing like others made previously, but the police knew that this was the Black Panther because the bullet that they recovered from Sidney Greylands matched the bullet that had been in the ceiling at one of the previous robberies. Nielsen's most famous crime, though, was the kidnap of Leslie Whittle. He first had the idea in 1972 when he read an article about um, £82,500 that she had inherited from her father, who ran Whittle Coaches. He had read about a kidnap in the US of an American heir heiress who had been held captive underground in a cell. Nielsen set out methodically planning the kidnap and learning everything they could about 17-year-old Leslie Whittle. On the 9th of January the 14th, 1975, Nielsen put his plan into action. He broke into the Whittles' home in Highley, Shropshire, and quietly abducted her from her bedroom, allowing her to put on only a dressing gown and a pair of slippers. On the lounge table, Nielsen left a ransom note on top of a box of chocolates, which he'd printed out on a roll of dino tape. The ransom note read, No police, £50,000 ransom to be ready to deliver. Wait for telephone call at Swan Shopping Centre telephone box, 6pm to 1am. If no call, return following evening. When you answer, give name only and listen. You must follow instructions without argument. From time you answer, you are on a time limit if police or tricks death. Swan Shopping Centre, Kidderminster, deliver £50,000 in a white van, 50000 in all old notes, 25000 in £1 notes and 25000 in £5 notes. There will be no exchange only after 50,000 has been cleared will victim be released. The next morning when Leslie failed to come down for breakfast, her mother went to her room to check that everything was all right. And when she saw that the bed was empty, she went to the lounge and found the ransom note and raised the alarm. Leslie, bro Leslie's brother, Ronald Whittle, decided to cautiously involve the police. Uh, it was agreed that due to the threat to Leslie's life that the ransom should be delivered as directed. While this was happening, Nielsen had taken Leslie to a disused drained shaft in Bathpool Park, which is in Kidsgrove, Staffordshire. He left her there with a rope around her neck, some basic food and a mattress to sleep on. A few hours after Leslie's disappearance, a freelance reporter had heard about the kidnap and the ongoing ransom situation and gave the story to a local radio station who decided that they would just broadcast the story with no consideration as to what impact this would have on Leslie's safety. Because of this, the police told Ronald Whittle to leave the shopping centre where he was waiting for the call. They wanted to avoid panicking the kidnapper and any danger to Leslie, I guess. The phone did ring just before midnight, but no one was there to answer. But no one was there to answer it. The next night, Ronald received a hoax call that sent him to a false rendezvous point. The night of the hoax call, an angry Donald Nielsen shot a security guard named Gerald Smith while attempting to raid a security depot. In his hurry to escape, Nielsen left behind his stolen green Morris 1300 at the, at the scene, close to Smith's body. The police didn't actually notice this car somehow for eight days. Uh, but when it was discovered and searched, they found a sleeping bag, um, recordings uh, that had been made by Leslie Whittle, along with a gun and ammunition and rolls of dino tape. Meanwhile, on the third night since Leslie's kidnap, Ronald again waited for the phone to ring. When it did, a recording of Leslie's voice told him to go and wait by a phone box in Kidsgrove. 
Ronald then drove to the police station to be briefed by detectives from Scotland Yard. At this point in the investigation, the police hadn't realised that the kidnapper was this Black Panther who'd robbed the sub post offices. So they weren't sharing information with the local police forces. There wasn't any information about either investigation exchanged between them. Ronald Whittle drove to Kidsgrove, followed by several unmarked police cars. cars rather. He got lost twice and then struggled to find the hidden message for 30 minutes. So it was around 3.30am when he got the message instructing him to go to Bathpool Park and wait for a flashlight signal. He did, but the signal never came. This is because Nielsen had driven and timed the route, and by his calculations, Whittle should have got there to the park at around 2.30am. A couple who were in their car at that time said that they'd seen someone flashing a torch, and they were confused. Um, and they also claimed that they'd seen a police car sat in the car park. Both West Mercia and Staffordshire Police are in disagreement about what happened with the police car, with West Mercia claiming Staffordshire blundered the exchange by sending in a panda car at a key moment, which Staffordshire Police, of course, deny. The next morning, the superintendent of West Mercia Police had wanted to search the park, but Scotland, the Scotland Yard team overruled him, declaring that there was nothing to be found. Nielsen had waited at the drop-off point, and when Ronald had, even after he'd done the signal, and when Ronald had failed to show, and after he'd spotted the police car, he became convinced that Ronald had cooperated with a police sting, and this made him fly into a rage. There is some speculation as to what happened next. Um, Nielsen returned to the drainage shaft where he'd got Leslie Whittle held captive and he either pushed Wesley from the ledge or she was shocked and she fell off the ledge. After police finally found the car at the security depot robbery and its contents and realised that this was the same car that had been used for some post the sub post office robberies they finally realized that the man they were looking for was the black panther until this point police hadn't been convinced that there was any real threat to leslie's life but now they knew that she had been taken by a very dangerous man the police had no leads for about three months and so in March, Police Superintendent Booth and Ronald Whittle appeared on TV to make an appeal for information. The very next day, a headmaster from a nearby school told police a pupil had brought him a torch with drop suitcase in hole stuck on the side in, with dino tape. The boy had found the torch um, in Bathpool Park several weeks earlier. Um, but neither of them had realised the significance of this torch until they had seen the TV broadcast. Following this, the police decided they better search Bathpool Park. And on March the 7th, the search was conducted and police began examining the drainage shaft and Leslie Whittle's body was found at the bottom of the shaft, still attached to the rope. A post-mortem was conducted and concluded that Leslie had not died from strangulation, but from the shock of the fall from the ledge. Her heart had stopped beating from a combination of the rope causing a build-up of pressure or high pressure in the carotid artery. And when she had fallen, this had triggered a response in her body that had basically just immediately stopped her heart. The pathologist also found that Leslie's stomach and intestines were empty and she had lost a considerable amount of weight. After his arrest, Nielsen had claimed that he had fed Leslie chicken soup, meatballs, fish and chips, some chicken legs, um, and if that's to be believed, and if she died on the night of the 17th, then one, why was her stomach and intestine empty? And two, how had she lost that much weight over the course of 80 hours?
Nielsen remained at large for much of 1975 and returned to robbing post offices, though he did not commit any further murders. The police investigation attempting to find the Black Panther was making no progress at all. However, on December the 11th, two uniformed officers were on patrol in Mansfield, Nottingham, when they spotted a man in black outside a post office with a hold all. The police officers called him over, asked what he was doing, and he said that he was on his way home and gave them a false name. When one of the officers asked whether he could write that name down, Nielsen pulled out a sawn off shotgun and pointed it at the police officers. He then forced one of them to get into the back of the car and ordered them to drive to Blidworth, which was about six miles away from where they were. Um, at some point during the drive, the officer in the back seat realised that the gun wasn't pointed at his colleague and managed to somehow signal to his colleague. And then he grabbed the gun and pulled it upwards whilst his colleague slammed on the brakes. The gun went off, but because it was pointed upwards, it just hit the roof of the car um, and no one was injured. The police then managed to force Nielsen out of the car um, and try to apprehend him. The car actually stopped outside a fish and chip shop. Um, and it was an evening and people were there waiting for their fish and chips and um, they were actually police were assisted by several customers who just happened to be workers down the local mine um, and they beat Nielsen pretty badly. <laughs> At the station, Nielsen again gave a false name and was generally being difficult when it came to questioning, though eventually he did give them his real name and address. It was only when Nielsen's home in Bradford was searched that the police realised that the man they had in custody was in fact the Black Panther. Under more intense questioning, Nielsen admitted that Leslie had died 12 hours after she had been kidnapped and that her death had been an accident. He also claimed he hadn't intended to carry out any or kill any of the postmasters, rather, and he was charged with four counts of murder and other offences. In March 1976, Gerald Smith, the security guard, that Nielsen had shot died from his injuries, but at the time, under UK law, Nielsen couldn't actually be charged as it was more than a year since the attack. The UK law has now changed. Nielsen's trial began at Oxford Crown Court on June the 14th, 1976. It was a very public event with people queuing to catch a glimpse of him. On July the 1st, Nielsen was unanimously found guilty and sentenced to a whole life sentence. Nielsen served this sentence at HMP Norwich, and in 2008 it was revealed that he had been suffering from motor neurone disease, um, and he died in prison on December the 18th, 2011. Documentaries made about Donald Nielsen lay heavy blame on the police as they hadn't taken Nielsen's initial threats seriously enough to order a press blackout and their decision not to search Bathpool Park even though the ransom had been ordered to be dropped there were heavily criticised. Interestingly, had Nielsen ended his activities after Leslie's death, it's possible because the police weren't getting anywhere with a Black Panther inquiry that he would have never been caught. Anyway, I hope that I have educated and informed you and I hope you enjoyed tonight's video. Good night and don't have nightmares.